chapter 5, verses 9 through 14, and I invite you to look along. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would have his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abuna and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than all of the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. And then this passage from Luke 24, verses 28 through 35. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? While he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions there. Together they were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road. And how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, as we again come into this time of reflection, seeking more of your wisdom, I ask that you might allow the words that I speak to be consistent with your will for us. And if there is anyone here who needs to hear a different I ask that you might speak directly to their heart, mind, and soul, that they may be aware of the love, care, peace, and comfort that you offer unto this morning. For it is in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Yesterday afternoon, I had been working out at the YMCA, and I was tired, and I just felt exhausted, so I decided I wouldn't go home and make the normal four-course meal that I normally make it under supper. <laughs> and instead, I called ahead to all the order to get a takeout order to take home. And so I called ahead and I got an order of fajitas to go because nothing says healthy like all the dough with fajitas, right? <laughs> all those condiments that we love so much like sour cream, Guacamole 
Now I want to confess, I'm a meat kind of guy. It may surprise you, not so much the vegetables, but I'm a meat kind of guy. But the condiments are important, aren't they? I mean, fajitas do not taste the same without sour cream and guacamole. And I was tired, but I was feeling kind-hearted. So I thought I would share my wisdom with the manager of On the Board in case this was a new employee, so they would not make the same mistake with the next person. So they would not live in the same spirit that I would have for the rest of the evening. And so I called and I spoke with the manager and, and I explained my, my problem. And he said, wait, wait just a minute. He goes, what's your name? You think I wanted to share my name? <laughs> I said, I had this vision of a big board and they put my name on it. And the next time I'm there to eat in person, I might have a little extra <laughs> something in my meal that I don't want. But I said my name. He said, well, i tell you what. He goes, Mr. Snell, he said, we are so sorry for that inconvenience. I'll tell you what, I'm going to send you some coupons so you can have some free food on us in the future because I know how important that is. And we want to take care of you. So can I have your address? I very quickly gave you my address. <laughs> and, and I was excited about that. And it made me feel good about that experience. And previously, when I, before on the border was in Midwest City, I was just really in the mood for fajitas. And, and I had called to another location in Oklahoma City. And I said, I'd like an order of fajitas to go. And apparently, new employees sometimes answer the phone and on the board. And on this occasion, she apparently thought I said, party fajitas. And so when I showed up and I'm waiting there, she goes, oh, sir, we're going to be with you, man. We're trying to get everything organized. And have you ever seen those large metal containers, the little to-go ones? And she comes and she lays up. She goes, we're working on it, sir. And she lays it and she runs away. And so I'm curious. God's always giving me sermon illustrations. I'm already thinking God for it. Another sermon illustration. So I look and I peek inside, and it is completely full of refried beans. I like refried beans. <laughs> I don't think that many refried beans. And here she comes in, she goes to the next thing, and I said, What's that? She said, That's the rice. She got said, Wait a minute, man. I said, I think we have a problem. I said, I'm here for just an order of fajitas to go. And she goes, Oh, no, no, you're the one who ordered party beans. And I said, oh no, I'm just a single guy. <laughs> I said, I can eat the meat, but I'll, I don't need that much of the others. <laughs> and so she said, well, hold on just a minute. And she went and got her general man. Cam comes out and talks to me and he goes, you know what, sir, I am so sorry for the inconvenience this caused you. Not a big inconvenience, right? But he says, so sorry for the inconvenience. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to give you all of this food and we're not going to charge you anymore. We are just so appreciative of your business. Now, do you think I would remember these stories from on the board and going to remember them five years from now? If I am somewhere and I hear someone talking bad about on the board or bad experience they had, do you think I'm likely to give a witness of two good experiences I had on the board? Of course I am. Why? Because I have value and experience that I have with them, not once, but twice. And they provided for me not only well, but above well in the midst of a problem situation. You and I, we remember stuff like that, don't we? We appreciate good customer service. And when it is repeated, it sticks with us in a different way. You and I are the same exact way when it comes to church, right? God is always good to us, and so we come back because we are always so thankful, we're always learning about God, what good God is doing in our life, right? Amen. Amen? <laughs> but not always, are we? Sometimes, even though God gives us more than the portion we have asked for, we are quiet as if God has given us no good. We need things on occasion to help us be reminded of God's goodness. And one of those great 
recognize and regret that one of the things that the Protestant movement did was throw out a lot of babies with the bathwater. Got rid of a lot of important rituals that had great meaning, that had great value for you and I as individuals as well as you and I as the church. What it means to have rituals, things that help us hold on to the value of our faith. I believe that God calls us <coughs> and has called us from the beginning to be a people of ritual. <coughs> ritual has certain aspects that are important to it. One is repetition. Another is authentic intention of presentation. Will you say that with me so I don't forget it later? Authentic intention of presentation. And then historic remembrance. Those three things are the essence of ritual. And what helps ritual have its grounded foundation. Repetition. Authentic intention of presentation and historical remembrance. And when we have those things, the benefactors of that value are us and <coughs> God. The ones that benefit from that type of a ritual recognition and importance are us and God. God. If 20 years ago I started telling Tom I loved him, and Tom told me he loved me, and then today I tell Tom I love him, is it going to mean the same thing to him as it did the first time I told him that 20 years ago? The answer is no. Because the first time I said it, it's different. It's new. Right? There is power in that intentional nature. And if Tom and I have been around each other for 20 years and I tell him every time I see him, I love him, it might become stale. It may lose some of its value, depending on how I present those words to him. <clears throat> and if I present those words to him, when I tell him 20 years down the road that I love him, it is going to have more depth than if it has lost its meaning because he is going to remember the historical value of that. He is going to remember ways that I have striven to show that to him and ways that I have received his love back in return. He's going to know that it's not empty. He's going to know that it has meaning. Part of the reason that he's going to know that is because it was repeated because of the authentic intention of the presentation of that love and the historical remembrance that it was proven to be true. And therefore, the beneficiaries of that love are going to be Tom and I, right? And so for ritual, as we deal with the aspect of God, that is our goal, to bring forth that type of a ritual practice within the church in which those things come to fruition, to which we cultivate that type of good fruit. Speaking of fruit, the most obvious thing that we do in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ on a weekly basis is the receiving of the communion elements. There are some church traditions who think we do it too often. And there are others like us who do it on a weekly basis. Now, if you and I come every Sunday and we're like, oh, this is stale one more week, or boy, the juice went bad this month, right? We have lost our focus, right? We have lost the intention that we come into that moment with and how we present ourselves into that opportunity of ritual. How do we come into those moments of communion? Communion is nothing new, is it? Communion predates Christianity, does it not? When Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper in the upper room, they were participating in a Jewish Seder meal, right? You all know that already. And then Jesus says, "Do this in." <clears throat> and so then there is the practice to be taught about doing communion that we see from the Luke passage that the disciples, in the midst of their
their daily living as we correlate with, even with Jesus present with them, the resurrected Christ in their midst, that they do not understand, even though Jesus is preaching to them the proclaimed scriptures. They don't get it until what happens? Until they are gathered at a table and Jesus blesses and breaks the
man wants to come and give God a whole bunch of money. There's only one problem with that. God doesn't have a bank account. So the only man that you can give back to God for the goodness of what he received is praise and glory. Something so simple. The message of what we are called to in the midst of ritual. Communion is so simple that we're not careful to miss the importance of it. It's pretty easy to choke down a stale, pez like piece of bread with a shooter of grape juice provided right by the Welch's, the Methodist influence that allows us to have this bag. Sorry for those of you who prefer wine. But we have grape juice instead, and so we get that experience. It's so simple, and it's so easy to experience that and not pause to do that repetition with authentic intention of presentation and remembrance of what the value of that communion meal is. The ritual of baptism, done differently again in different churches, right? We think about what it is there to be washed and to be healed in that for most of us, it is not hard to get into a tank of water. It may be harder to get out, but it's not hard to get into a tank of water. But what is it to get the symbolism, the meaning, the depth of what that ritual brings to it? The gift of saying, yes, I am washed anew. I have the opportunity to let the past go and to be something new and clean again because God has ordained it to be a possibility. And again, that's nothing new. Baptism predates the Jewish faith, even, right? Baptism's in all sorts of different religious beliefs. It's nothing new, but it is something special. Because of what that ritual, the importance of that ritual, means to us. Prayer. I kind of messed up on Julie Mulder this morning. I got off my topic in my children's moment. The question came up to them about when did people begin to be able to pray directly to God. And I had this whole idea in my head, and it just went, so it didn't make it. But the ritual of, of praying to God, now when we do it in a children's moment, now I'm going to disappoint some of you haven't heard this yet, but I wasn't going to say it in this verse, but I'm not a big fan of children's moments. Because rarely do they really do anything educational. Oftentimes they're cute moments. And that's a value too. I mean, there's something there. But for me, when I started doing children, I wanted to make sure there was something of consistent value to it. And this is the case with most of us. No original idea, right? I stole from the influence of other ministers that I had been around, and I took ideas I learned from them, and that's where I got the idea of doing a repetition prayer with kids in the children's moment. Why do I do that? For me, that is a ritual of teaching them how to pray. Is the prayer still authentic? Yes. I think it is. And at the same time, it is a ritual that we do on a weekly basis to help them learn how to pray so in their own lives, when they're by themselves, they have learned a method of how to pray. It's not that I came up with, it's something I stole. And I hope those kids steal it and give it to somebody else. It is a ritual, but it is a ritual that has meaning when we come to it with meaning. When we come to it with a willingness to want to have that carried over so that it carries over to us in our home life, in our community prayer life, in our other times when we're praying with people as elders, as deacons, as other settings in our life, even if it's a family gathered around a meal, that there is value in that prayer, that it is not an empty procedure that you have to do before you eat. But where is an opportunity to converse with God? And where did that conversation begin? 
The same way the Gospel of John starts is the same way that Genesis starts with three words. In the beginning. Because who was the first one to engage in conversation with God? According to the scripture story, Adam. God's plan for God's people from the beginning was ritual. The repetition of practices done with intentional nature where then people could look back on God's historical works and the way that God was consistent and the ways that God proved to be faithful. One of the things that Tommy, I'm glad that Tommy sang this last Sunday. He sang it, touched me, as a part of a song with another son, and I don't even remember what it was. But he, he sang two songs, blended into one, and he started with He Touched Me, and He Touched Me is a song that we often, in the church world, don't sing anymore because it makes us uncomfortable because someone might be offended. And you know what? That is valid. It is shameful that it is valid, but it is valid. But touch is so important in the church. Even in the passing of the peace, I'm going to roll my eyes a little bit. Even in the passing of the peace, when we give a handshake or we give a hug or even if it's a smile that we share, we recognize that might be the only physical contact that person has for the rest of that week. That might be the one ritual that they look forward to most in the Sunday morning service. Now, I hope communion is ultimately that, but the need that we have for someone to give us affirmation that they care about us, that they want us to be in a place of peace, that they love us enough that they will reach out and touch us, that we are not untouchable. What it is to think about those services that we have on Monday, Thursday, or Nash Wednesday, when there is an opportunity to come and to have an elder pray over you. Some of the most powerful experiences that I've had in my life is not when I prayed over someone, but when someone has laid hands and prayed over me. Some of you all have, have heard me share the story when I left Arkansas. I was attending on Monday nights actually a Methodist church that had a predominant number of homeless people that were in. And I did not realize they were going to do it my last night down on Monday night. They came and they laid hands on me for my ministry after I left Arkansas. I had homeless people laying their hands on me, praying over my ministry. If that kind of thing doesn't give you goosebumps, if that type of thing does not speak to your faith about what is authentic, about what is deep, about what God is calling us to, then you need your spirit stirred. God calls us to be a people of ritual. God calls us to embrace moments and to build into our personal lives as well as to our church life, moments where we are challenged to remember the goodness of God, where we build into our lives repetitious things that will make us go, oh yeah, Jesus just broke the bread. Oh my gosh, that reminds me of what I have forgotten. Most of us have had some point in our life where we have steered away. And fortunately for me, mine was first semester my freshman year, and I apologize, Mom. I'm sure Matt would never do that, right, Matt? <laughs> we, most of us have had moments where our faith became less of our priority for us. <clears throat> And for me, I am thankful for those rituals in my life that call me back to center. That yes, acknowledge my humanness, that yes, acknowledge my brokenness, yes, that acknowledge that I'm going to mess it up again, but still that ritual that reminds me that God has created me, God has chosen covenant with me, God has called me into moments of remembrance. God has blessed us with those types of 